Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, we are going to do intros in a second, but overall, we're looking to give you some insight into the bug bounty world from three very different perspectives on this, everywhere from ro running program management, running the policy village here as well, or at least uh, being very important regarding it, uh, all the way through to black badge winners and everything in between for this. Uh, so to start off, we'll do a few quick intros and then we'll chat through our overall agenda. Yeah, so, Katie, you're first up here. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Katie Noble, uh, otherwise known as Lady N. I am the person for the Policy Village, so come see us in 237. Um, so uh, my background is actually in behavioral analysis, and uh, I got into tech a couple years ago because I was thrust into it by the government. Um, did uh, Worked for the government for many, many years, and I currently run um, uh, the product security incident response and bug bounty for a big Fortune 50 company, but I'm not going to tell you which because I don't represent them right now. Uh, this it's is not a, on the slides, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and my claim to fame is that in my career, I've coordinated over 20,000 cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Definitely can't top that. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan Cuscos. Uh, some of you know me as Bad Idea. Um, I've kind of done both sides of being a full-time bug bounty hunter, also managing responsible disclosure programs. And so I've probably got the intermediate experience here of like half of her side, half of his side. Um, currently the founder of Chaotic Good Information Security. My background is very much that of the offensive security red team or penetration tester, fully on the vulnerability front and identifying what's truly vulnerable, how do we really fix it, and communicating that across aisles, which is obviously uh, sometimes difficult for engineers as they get a little bit more up their craft. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm a security engineer at Google. Uh, I help run uh, one of our nine bug bounty programs um, and our kind of core Google.com bug bounty program. Um, I have a couple of DEF CON black badges. Uh, yeah, that's my kind of claim to fame. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. I'm a senior security engineer at GitHub. I work on the bug bounty program. I uh, like to drive fast cars on curvy roads. I like to hit the track a lot um, when I'm not on the computer. And I love building bug bounty programs, both private, public, from nothing to full scope programs. And uh, very excited to be here with you. Thank you. All right, wonderful. And I am Logan. I work with Jeff also at GitHub, helping run bug bounty over there. Had great experiences working with everyone on the panel, and I think we're going to give you a wonderful, uh, wonderful insight into everything going on here today. All right. All done. Yeah. All right. So we're going to pose this as sort of here's a question. We're going to let them talk, and Jeff and I are going to be hanging off to the side. So given that we're here to talk about bug bounty, I mean, this seems like the obvious introduction. Uh, so Coast Coast, we'll start with you on this one. What got you into the world of bug bounty originally? So this is going to dial back about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, I started doing responsible disclosure and bug bounty hunting as a very broke college student with over six figures of student loan debt, as it often happens here in the United States. I had my first penetra penetration testing job for a company, but the pay wasn't great. I, didn't, I wasn't really like the best at my craft. Um, you know, we started off a little bit lower. And so I started moonlighting bug bounty moves. Back at that time, there was no hacker one, no bug crowd, no commercialized sort of platform to um, just bring you into it easily and get you straight in front of clients. So the thing that I was doing back then was actually looking at a lot of Google acquisitions and the Google acquisitions would allow you to submit a vulnerability only after they had owned it for six months. Um, pretty easy to find a list of acquisitions. Uh, so I would find as many bounties as I could and then I sat on them until the six month part uh, scripted the submission to happen at 1201 that night. Sorry, I don't think you were there at the time. Um, and that really got me into a lot of it back then, but my motivations were a little bit split between one being like a starving student trying to make his name in the world. Um, obviously the financial implications of doing well in the bug bounty world can be quite lucrous. Uh, so I started doing that um, while also just using that as a way to get better at being a security engineer, at being a penetration tester. It's a little bit different to take a client scoped engagement versus what's public out there on the real world. So you get various different maturities. You see a lot of different technologies really fast um, and I think that really expands your caliber as a bug bounty hunter, uh, just to see how things work, how different people implement the same thing in different ways. And you get a lot of real world wisdom and experience very, very quickly if you do that over and over and over again, day after day. Who wants to pick it up from there? Um, so uh, 
I got in a little bit of a different way. So one of my uh, teammates from DEF CON uh, reached out to me. I was like, hey, I'm going to this live hacking event uh, in New York City. You should come down. I was in Boston, so in Boston. And so I went down there and I participated in this live hacking event. Only I was using curl. I wasn't using anything else. I, was, I knew exactly what everyone else was doing, but I was very, very slow. And so I made it my mission to get faster, but then also to become a better bug bounty hunter. And fast forward a couple of, well, I didn't find anything there. Fast forward a couple of years, I actually won one of the events. Um, so that, that was my kind of how I got into this and how I ramped up from there. I guess that's me. Um, so my background, like I said, was government. Um, I spent about 15 years in the US government doing various things. Like I said, my background's in behavioral analysis, so it's all about why people do the things that they do. Um, so I found myself at Homeland Security at uh, the agency currently known as CISA. I was not CISA when I was there. Um, but I was essentially moved into a position where I was acting as an intermediary. So um, researchers, hackers, come to can come to the US government, even at that time, and say like, hey, I'm being threatened by X company. Um, and it was my job to go to that company and be like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> like, this is not going to work out. Um, and you can threaten that hacker all you want, but I've got a fleet of lawyers, so go ahead and try to threaten me. Um, and so I acted as an intermediary a lot, um, basically as a, I feel like a camp counselor a lot, um, which was great because I could use all of my, uh, all of my, my behavioral analysis background um, to mediate a lot of um, fairly high profile um, uh, vulnerabilities. A lot of the hackers that would come to us were very, very serious about, like they were looking at airplanes and nuclear power plants and water plants. These are very serious things. Um, that needed to be fixed. And so that was really how I got into it. And then uh, eventually I moved out of government um, into the private sector, um, running bug bounty programs in the private sector. So, wonderful. So moving on, and thank God I have good notes here. Uh, one of the things you had touched on, Sam, is you know starting with Curl and, and wanting to be faster and working with everybody else. So as you've gone through this, and I guess starting from the hacker side and, and sort of looking at it from the response side as well, what, what tools, what techniques have you found to be uh, the most valuable when you're going through and actually doing bug hunting without getting too, too in-depth because we are on the clock? <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, it's, it's mostly about, well, what makes you move faster? Um, what makes you find things? And more importantly, what makes you reject things that aren't interesting as quick as possible? Um, and the faster you can do that, the more targets you can look at, um, the more successful you'll be. Simultaneously, it's also important to use your tools to find other targets. So like look for weird subdomains, look for weird places. Um, maybe pivoting this a little bit on the program side, program management side, like using templates to respond to researchers. Um, you'll often get the same invalid reports over and over again. If you have to write a custom response every time, like it's just gonna slow you down. Um, yeah. I'll take it from there. Um, so I think if, first off it depends on like what your particular vertical of security is, because just by saying like what kind of pen tester are you, it's like saying like what, what do you do in cybersecurity? And you know, there's a million different verticals. Uh, can I like quickly ask the room like, who are all the web application folks here? Some like network? Infrastructure, endpoint detection. Okay, so it's kind of all over the place. And so, like saying, like using Burp Suite to go really deep doesn't mean much to someone who isn't an application security person. Um, and if you're someone who's entirely in web application security, you might be a little deer in the headlights when you find a command injection. And it's like, okay, actually, like pivot off that box. Um, when it comes to the tools that you're using, I think more importantly than just like finding the right tool that just helps you know, find things automatically, you really need to align that with what your particular vertical is and what you understand really well. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to go deep in new areas of security that you might not be the best at. Like, so for instance, one of my weak points is like malware reversal. So if I find malware on a machine, I'm probably not gonna spend 20 hours trying to figure out how to reverse it. I'm gonna find one of my friends who's really good at malware stuff and say, hey, we're gonna partner on this one so I can go back to what I do best. Um, yeah, little pivot, held a die on. <laughs> I'm gonna pivot farther. Um, so we're talking about technology tools, but from my perspective, the best tools that we can have are really the behavioral kind of tools. So like common sense, I think is probably the best tool that I have available. Um, I get a lot of reports from a lot of folks and some of them are really high quality, really good 
quality um, criticality and some of them are not. Um, and some of them seem like they're social engineering or just not good quality reports until you actually start digging into them. So like, um, I always like make sure my engineers like really look at that report because it could at first appearance be like incomplete or not like not well formed or just garbage. But in reality, some of the very best critical vulnerabilities are in that way. Um, even negative testing results are very valuable because negative testing tells us where there is something, but it may not be ready yet. And so common sense to me is really important and diligence is really important. Um, and just being willing to answer questions like, uh, the thing that drives me crazy is when we get what I refer to as like these cookie crumb results where it's like somebody will send a report in to us and it will be like pieces and then we'll say like, hey, do you have like, can you give me more information about this proof of concept? And they'll be like, well, you're the company, you figure it out. <laughs> and it's like, well, your, car, your report's probably going to go in the garbage because I have 500 other reports and you're taking time from those other hackers who took the time to put the report together so that I can actually follow it so that I can pay them out quickly. Um, but we try to make sure that we are taking as much time as possible, even with those reports, staying calm and going back to the researcher and being like, hey, look, I know you're frustrated, but um, I think you have something here, but you, you need to work with me to help me figure out what is here so that I can get you paid. Um, so I would say like common sense and due diligence are probably the best tools that I have in my toolbox. Um, from running a program side. So that's, real, uh, real quick, before we move on, I want to make sure that like we actually give like good answers for that one too, because like what what tools do you use if you're actually going to get started? Um, any sort of man in the middle intercepting proxy for your browser is absolutely a must for application security. If you're needing to find new services on endpoints, it's time to get really familiar with Nmap or Naboo if you're familiar with the Project Discovery Toolkit. Everyone should just download everything that Project Discovery has. Uh, it's free. It's open source. It'll really help you just get from recon to vulnerability pretty quickly. And there's some nuance that you can learn there. Um, but you're gonna need tools that will help you go deep in an application. You're gonna need tools that will help you go wide across several applications. Nuclei is really good for that. Um, their version of Nmap called Naboo is also fantastic. And that will get you most of the way there. At that point, I think you'll start having more hosts than you know what to do with. And this is where you have to start determining like, okay, where do I spend time? What do I put my manual efforts towards? And I think the thing that you want to remember is that you're going to want to use automation to help you find targets to then go in on manually. Uh, because at least when it comes to the bug bounty world, it's first and best dressed. And the reason I wanted to talk about that is because exactly what you just said. You might get breadcrumb vulnerabilities. And so let's say myself as the researcher, I found something that's really cool. I'm pretty sure this is going to pay out. I can spend two hours putting together a really good report, but in that two hour time, someone else could put in a low quality report, yet they're first and they're going to get paid out. And so there's kind of like a meta to bug bounty hunting where you have to decide, okay, how much information can I give that's relevant uh, to make this seem valid? And again, if you're competing with other people, I might start thinking, maybe let me submit this incomplete and then go back and edit it later. Can we start looking at submission dates? The first one is the only one that matters. Is that the right thing to do? You know, I think we can have a discussion around that, but if there was a meta to bug bounty hunting, that is definitely one part of it. Just to add one thing to that, you'll never be faster. Any tool you use will never be faster than mass scan. So mass scan first and then move on. <laughs> awesome. Well, a great segue to that is uh, for Katie. Where do human efforts provide value than more value than automation efforts, right? So pivoting off of tooling, where are humans uh, the most efficient, the most valuable? Oh, Lord. Um, so, I mean, I see a lot of, I, I've started to see a lot of AI generated reports come in last year or two, and those are okay. Um, <laughs> uh, from where I sit, like, I work mostly hardware, firmware, and software. I don't work a lot of SaaS, so um, the AI stuff isn't really valuable to us because we're looking at like hardcore CVEs versus like what I would consider to be misconfigurations. Um, so, it is a little bit of a different ball game, but um, I, I, I think it goes back to like that negotiation period, right? Like you can put in an empty, like not an empty, but a placeholder report, which we can have that conversation about whether you should or not. Um, <laughs> uh, but there is more to it than just lobbing the report over the, over the wall. Um, you're going to enter a negotiation period, right? You're going to enter a negotiation period with the triager who is receiving your report. You're probably going to enter a negotiation period, at least in hardware and firmware, where you're, uh, you're going to have to work with an engineer or an engineer is going to be working on the back end without your knowledge, which happens usually that's what's going on in that quiet period where they don't respond to you for months. 
Um, but they're working on trying to figure out a mitigation, right? And so that negotiation, anytime I walk into a room and it's I want, if I, if I want anything, even like, even ordering coffee, like I want something, that's a negotiation. Congratulations, you've just entered a negotiation. Um, because, and that's, that's a human to human interaction. So you can lob the report over the, uh, over the wall, but you're probably gonna get a better result if you walk into it understanding there's likely a human involved in there and you're about to enter multiple phases of negotiation. So that's my uh, suggestion. Uh, one of the areas that I really like for human efforts over automated stuff is like, let's say a new target comes my way. Um, I immediately skip everything unauthenticated. I, I skip everything that would be the first one or two clicks away from whatever the main domain page is. I go straight to anything behind credit card functionality because that is always, I feel like, what people put like on the last of their checklist. It's like, okay, I'm enumerating the application. I'm enumerating whatever the target platform may be. And this bit requires a credit card and it can't just be a gift card. It has to be something valid or maybe like an ACH transfer has to happen overnight for them to confirm a balance. Go straight to that, get the clock running on it as soon as possible. Even if you need to go, I mean, I guess like, this is not financial advice, just in case that matters. Um, also not a lawyer, this is not legal advice, all of those things. Um, I have created separate accounts that I can use for all of that, um, where I can add bank accounts, where I can add credit cards, it's separated from my personal stuff, and the setup for that is, it's easier than installing the old version of Bloodhound, uh, <laughs> if that's a bit of a deep cut. But like you should do that if you're remotely serious about bug money hunting because that's gonna put you in, ahead of 80, 90% of other people who are out there hunting for stuff banging on the same login page. Um, especially if it's something where a new target has been exposed to everyone for the first time. And so you can imagine like maybe scope started at midnight, but you're racing with a lot of other people around the world. And so you have to get to the functionality that other people are likely to test last um, if you want to get the low hanging fruit first. Obviously you can go deep, you can look at business logic analysis, wherever that sort of stuff comes in. I love anything with a contact us form. Um, anything that requires extra information to get to deeper areas of the application, it's gonna take automation even further to get to those areas and that's gonna depend on how good whoever's automation is at spidering, which it's already not good at maintaining authenticated versus unauthenticated states as soon as something hits like a logout feature or you trigger rate limiting that logs you out or God forbid it's still a web sphere application. Those have uh, unique URLs every time you log in or out. Automation completely fails at those. And so when you start identifying those technologies, I mean, I think the spider sense starts kicking in where you're like, okay, it's, there's likely not a lot of competition on this one. If I was gonna spend eight hours somewhere, this might be worth the time because it's a lot of cost benefit analysis on where your efforts are gonna go. And it really sucks if you spend eight hours working on something that you're pretty sure is vulnerable, you don't find anything, and now you have the sunken cost fallacy sort of thought of what did I do with my day? Uh, which I think we're gonna get into that later question, so I don't wanna go too much on it here. But that's where I would spend human efforts over automation ones. Um, so just to add to the uh, human effort, so w when you're testing web applications you come across like a laugh, you'll often, it's an often, it's an easy way to get yourself banned, especially using automation. And so as a human, you have to, you have the ability to infer that something is vulnerable without necessarily proving it using like a full exploit that would get your IP banned, that would get you your account banned. Um, when I see a WAF, it, it doesn't actually, for some, for some researchers, it's, it's, it can be like a, a showstopper. For me, it's the place I'll actually dive in more because, you know, you find the right quote character um, that's gonna get past laugh and it might throw some interesting error, you know? Um, yeah, I, I see that as like a really a place where humans thrive versus AI. Um, you know, simultaneously I'm sure AI will get better or automation will get better. You know, real quick, when you, when you find that a WAF has blacklisted you, don't forget about it. If Akamai or Cloudflare or something has locked you out, write down that application, go back to it later with a different IP. Um, or lock out other IPs as you're scanning for everything. Because if you end up with a list of things that are behind Cloudflare and things that are behind Akamai, guess where you should spend human efforts? Exactly all of those. This is also like a little bit in the weeds, but if you find yourself getting a WAF block coming back from a server that's not Akamai or Cloudflare, um, that means that you have the potential to DOS an application by blocking the front end service sometimes. Um, I don't know, it's a fun variant of this. Very cool. So it's easy to get in really deep and, you know, go into rabbit holes and eventually also just get tired of responding to incidents, right? How do you find balance? How do you, uh, what are some potential tips you can offer to folks, you know, who are proactively 
burning out or how, you know, how do you approach it? And I would love for, for Sam to start with this. Uh, sure. Um, so on the researcher side, I mean, it, it's the same as being at DEF CON. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I don't want to sleep. I don't want to eat. I don't want to, sh well, I should shower. Um, <laughs> it's, everyone should shower. Um, it, it's the same thing with bug bounty hunting. It can become very addictive and you have to balance it with the rest of your life. Um, you know, if you're having a bad week at work, maybe don't do bug bounty at night. Um, you know, I think like simultaneously on the program side, if you're the only program manager and you're getting in 25 reports a day, like that's not sustainable. Um, you know, at least within Google, like we try and go for like no heroes policy. Um, we have a well, roughly once every seven week or so rotation, um, a little bit less than that now, I think, um, where you're only on call once out of every seven weeks. Um, and that helps keep things sane. <laughs> I'm next. Um, so yeah, I agree. Like everything, every job, everything that you're passionate about, you're gonna like have burnout in. Um, from an industry perspective, um, we have a lot of engineers that are sitting, uh, receiving reports, doing triage, doing mitigation, doing uh, disclosure planning, and it gets really exhausting. I had an engineer to tell me the other day, you know, like I have 75 tickets, and I'm not even happy when I close a ticket anymore because I know that I still have 74 tickets. Um, to close, like she used to be like really excited every time she closed a report. Um, and now not so much and like that's real. Um, I think everyone is undermanned, especially with like a lot of the technology layoffs that have happened in the last four to five years, like um, being smarter about how we do things, incorporating tools on how we actually handle vulnerabilities and, um, and disclosures, I think is really important. Looking for efficiencies and building those efficiencies and automation into systems and processes is incredibly important. Um, I would rather that, I see it kind of like a, like a doctor's office, right? I would rather that my doctors be doing um, surgery than filling out insurance forms. So um, where you can offload onto uh, you know, a specific triage team, you should do that. Um, so your you know, mitigation engineers are not doing triage and mitigation. Um, so it's about like balancing workload, balancing processes, making sure that you're looking for automation opportunities. Um, and <laughs> we do a rotation. So um, our engineers will only do tickets for a certain amount of time. Um, so it's usually about three months and then that's it. They're not doing tickets again for another three months. They move into an entirely different job. So maybe today they're doing triage tickets and uh, when their three months is up, they're doing comms, they're doing disclosures, they're doing something entirely different so that it doesn't matter that she has 74 tickets left. That's now somebody else's problem for the next three months. Um, so we try to incorporate a rotation um, and we try to make sure that we're looking for those automation opportunities. Technology has evolved and changed so much in the last several years that it's really irresponsible if you're not on the industry side looking for ways to make the processes better and easier and more efficient for your engineering team. That makes things better and more efficient and faster for your bug hunters. The faster that's triaged, the faster they get paid, the happier they are, and then everyone is happy. Um, so I think it's irresponsible to not be thinking about your team health along with, uh, along with building those processes, making sure you're efficient and uh, really just keeping an eye on your people. Very well said. Um, so this thought kind of just crossed my mind. I don't think any of us thought 10 years ago that we'd get a dopamine hit from seeing an alert box pop up. <laughs> and you know, it feels just like pulling that slot machine, if we're gonna make a gambling reference because we're in Vegas, and just seeing something pop up. Um, Dopamine feels great. And so the same thing, anytime any scanner comes back as something that's positive and then you verify and it's really there, like that feeling of like, oh yes, like I just got this thing is just infectious. Um, just like with anything that you enjoy doing, balance is absolutely key. You have to keep a time on that clock. Um, some of us have real addictive personalities and suddenly you find yourself, you know, it's 4 a.m., you haven't had dinner and you've got a lot to do the next day. but. We can get real addicted to hunting for vulnerabilities in new content that is always, you know, especially if you're going from application to application to application, there's always something new. There's always something, like some new rabbit hole that's pulling your interest, um, or you're working on one application because you've gone through so many, the light bulb pops on something that you were touching an hour ago. Um, I should probably mention this with the tool bit earlier, but like actually the best tool that I have is a timer that I have on my desk. And I tell myself the 15 minute rule. 
So after I've been working on a particular area of an application or a target for you know just a couple of minutes, if nothing has been like immediately apparent that something is there, I start the timer. If that 15 minute timer goes off and I've not made any meaningful progress, go to the next functionality or consider taking a break and stepping away from the computer. Um, that'll help you find more vulnerabilities too, because I can't tell you how many times I've been on a page where I was just certain SQL injection is here. Like there's just something I'm just not getting across. It's not actually vulnerable. And if you would have just gone to the next bit of functionality, there might be RCE there, or there might be something, some breadcrumb that's worth chasing down. So manage your time effectively, just like anything else is not specific to hacking. This, this is the same advice for anyone who's seeking like mental health wellness. Um, what we do is very exciting, it's very addicting, and those of us with addictive personalities really need to keep a grasp on that. Um, going back to the program side for a minute, you also control your own economy. Um, if you're getting in a ton of reports, like consider lowering payments. Um, you'll still probably get a few reports in, but like that might dissuade researchers from spending as much time on your program. Similarly, if you're not getting reports in, then pay more. Um, you know, control that input to some extent anyways. Um, and that kind of gets more to like the business side of everything, but yeah. Very cool. So this is one of my personal favorite questions. Um, from a hacker view, what makes a product or an application a good target? What makes a, a good candidate for a bug bounty program from the program side as well when you're considering spinning up a program? But we're going to start with Cusco's for this one. Sure. So as much as I hate to say it, I'm going to say it. Uh, we've all heard shift left a million times and anyone working in security has heard this sort of thing get brought up and the concept is basically the earlier that we can identify bugs and fix them in the development life cycle, the cheaper it will be to remediate. Bug bounty programs are as far right as possible as that shift left could be. So when we're, as you're running a program, if you're identifying candidates for your bug bounty program, it should be something that has already had all the gambits of internal due diligence. In an ideal world, you have you know secret scanning hooked into the CI/CD. You have rule sets for insecure functions not being used. You're running some sort of SAS tool. You're running some sort of DAS tool. You're running some sort of runtime analysis. And maybe if you're lucky, you have an internal pen testing team who can give it all once over assessment before it actually goes out to production and you know the real world. Um, obviously, that's a lot of resources. Not everyone has a 200-person product security team. But if you have something that has not gone through all those areas of due diligence and you're going straight to making it a valid bug bounty target, that's fine. That is just probably the most expensive way to get uh, security improvements made on that particular product. At the same time, there's usually nothing academic or uh, you know, not real once it's in production. These are targeting customers now, um, actively in impacting them. And again, it's not a theoretical or academic finding. So usually there's movement to get it pushed out. Um, the other thing that I like doing, if I get multiple reports of the same thing, I treat that as an increased likelihood of exploitation. So something, you know, if you get 10 different people telling you a thing is coming in and it's rated as a medium, well, if 10 different unique people can find it and they're not sharing that information, maybe that should probably be a high and we shouldn't kick that down the can every three months as business accepted risk. Um, but basically, it's, it's kind of common sense stuff. Uh, if you go straight to the bug bounty program, that is the most expensive way to identify vulnerabilities on it. There'll probably be real good ones, though. Um, it could be more cost effective to do something a little bit more on the shift left sort of pipeline, but it's just the reality of it. Um, yeah, just to, just to add to that a little bit, I feel like if you're getting the same critical vulnerabilities in every month, then you're just paying that researcher's mortgage. Um, it's not like your, your role as a bug bounty program manager should be to push the business to do more comprehensive fixes for things or to find every variant of this or to introduce some additional scanning or something. Um, it's, it's on you, the program manager, to make that happen. The researcher is just going to keep submitting. You know, they're, they're not interested in the systematic fixes. Yeah, I mean, like, the shift left thing is, is <laughs> you hear it all the time, but, like, we're kind of stuck with the roadmap, right? So whatever product is coming on the market, and those products are based on customer-driven needs, right? So a customer wants this, this product is built, the product goes through testing, it gets internal red teams, it gets uh, lots of um, pen testing and security evaluations and hackathons and whatever internally. Uh, and then it gets on the market and that's where VDP comes in place. So vulnerability disclosure, which is not usually paid. So that's your see something, say something. And then and only then <laughs> should it uh, end up in the bug bounty space. Um, so bug bounty is true adversary emulation in my mind. And so you're looking at things that are actively accessible 
but there are places where you can insert yourself um, into that product lifecycle before it gets on the market. Um, if you have a good researcher base that has really qualified and really awesome researchers in that space that align with that target or that product, um, why not consider running a private uh, bug bounty event on that product before that product goes on the market? Um, you're likely to get really, really good results that way because usually developers and hackers have different mindsets. Some are fixers and some are breakers. Um, and if you approach it from an adversary perspective, like most bug hunters do, um, you're likely to get really good results that way. And then putting the bug hunters and the engineers in the same room, um, I've had really good results with that. Um, just sit them next to each other and let them challenge each other. Um, works really well. Um, uh, so then I can get those products fixed before it ever even goes on the market. And then at that point, um, then it goes through the rest of the process. Product gets launched on the market, Pro problems have already been fixed, uh, looks good for the company because you don't have as many CVs or any negative reports or bad press. Um, then product goes into VDP and then it goes into bug, bug hunting, right? So bug bounty. So I would say there are probably opportunities to insert one's bug bounty program um, into the product lifecycle. But when you think about from a, from a uh, industry perspective, there is a reason that you have a bug bounty program. And that reason is so that you can take those vulnerability reports that you get, you can analyze them, you can do trend analysis on them, and you can force them back into your SDL, right? So your, your, your um, life cycle, right? You, you want to not have that same kind of vulnerability pop up over and over again in, in, secession, in secession or in multiple products that use the same ingredients. So if you don't do that part, then the only people who suffer are the product engineers who are having to manage the reports on the other end. So it's really important to integrate the bug bounty program back into the development lifecycle. Um, there are lots of ways to do that. Uh, chargebacks is one of my favorite. Uh, for, every, uh, for every payment that goes out to a bug hunter, you charge back the business unit that owns that program. Um, <laughs> So, so they feel the pain. That's the point, right? Um, I'm, I, if you don't know me, um, I've worked in this field for 20 something years. Uh, I'm all out of carrots. Um, I only have sticks left. Uh, so, so if, if the way to feel the pain and to make the change is going to be hitting someone's pocketbook, cause that's what they understand, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, so it's all about that completing that cycle, right? If it gets to the end and you still have reports and those reports are the same reports over and over again or the same template, like then that template, uh, that researcher is doing the same thing over and over again. They're finding multiple problems in multiple products and we're playing whack-a-mole to fix it. That's, that's not a good way to do it. So that needs to go back to the red team. The red team needs to go and fix all of those problems and all of those products and all of those ingredients and they need to be forced to do that sometimes. So it's all about integrating and making sure that you're adequately using incentives, uh, both on your bug side and on your internal side. You know, real quick, you mentioned that there's only pain involved, but I don't think that's pain from the bug hunter who is getting, you know, 30 different duplicates sent across different targets and, you know, fishing for that payout 30X, which sometimes it's valid, sometimes it's not. What do you think? It's pain whenever they've submitted 30 reports of the same, they did the same thing 30 times and got 30 different issues and then my team got wise to it and uh, went back and did their, their due diligence on all products and then suddenly that pipe is just dried up. Which is ideal, that's what we want. So just to bring it back to Bug Bounty Meta, uh, something that I've done before, when I've identified that you can find vulnerabilities on let's say 30 different products, do I submit all 30 or do I submit two? It's and then once those two get paid out, do I submit two more? No, and so. <laughs> no, submit 30 because if you submit. If like you get one payout. No, not necessarily. It depends on the product. It depends on the program. Absolutely. But But if you submit two and then you wait, you've now given my engineers time to fix the product in all the products, which means those 28 you were holding on to are no longer valid. So I'm going to jump in for one second because this, so, so this is the no, this is the perfect segue. So talking about different ways to approach this, 
from both perspectives, what, what qualities do the best programs for this have? How are you doing that sort of dupe detection? How are you playing that game? And how are you finding the targets that you want? And uh, Katie, since I cut you off, you're the first person to take this one. Oh, Lord. OK. Uh, what <laughs> qualities? Um, oh. Well, now, I, now my train of thought's interrupted. Uh, Chris, Chris, help me out. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, so I think the general mantra for a program manager is to allocate budget towards the areas that you want to reinforce behavior for. So that can mean a couple of different things that are situational based on the bugs that are coming in. So if I'm running a program and one person has submitted like a templated vulnerability, let's say that I own a lot of infrastructure on the internet and they found something that applies to a whole lot of those things, um, I would appreciate knowing all of them at once as a bug bounty program manager. But I also realize that, hey, this person could have given me one and I may have paid them the same. And so I think you need to reinforce the behavior that you want to see. So if this is a good, high quality researcher who gives great reports, um, they respond back to you quickly, they're friendly. If you have the budget for it, pay them a multiple for what it is. Find a way to make whole based on the effort that they put into finding the thing. And I think you can often see based on the report comes in, like did someone run a scanner for 30 minutes and stumble across something that is interesting and something we still need to fix? Or did this require them going down the rabbit hole for two particular weeks? And then they found something really cool, but maybe it's a one to many situation. Um, and not everyone has an infinite budget, so it's a little sticky there, but they probably deserve more than a 1x payout. Is it 2x, 4x, 8x, 20x, you know, half of what they submitted? Um, I think it's more important that you're fair and that good faith behavior goes both ways, both as the researcher who's submitting the bug and saying, hey, I found a thing, I would like some something for what has been done, especially if you're going to make a code fix change for any of that. I think that's the general mantra. If you submit a bug, they make some change, it's in scope, you should pay out. Hill to die on. Um, but, the, but from the program manager's standpoint, it's going to depend on your budget. You can't also just like bleed everything instantly because of this one thing that came by, because you might have a couple more quarters or the rest of the year to get through. So you have to also like be the king that's managing your resources effectively as well for your kingdom that is this bug bounty program. How's that for seeding and starting it off? I appreciate that, yeah. Uh, so, so, I mean, the best programs that I've seen are programs that are responsive, that have interesting targets, that triage quickly, pay people quickly. Um, I've seen a lot of programs that um, don't really, they, they're kind of just templated, right? They just took a, they just took some, some I don't mean to bash the platforms, but like, they just did what the platform said and followed that bo that box, but they never really like thought about what is my product and then what is the skill set that's needed in order to hack my product and then how do I efficiently incentivize those those skill sets, right? So like I think there is something to the human element. There's multiple kinds of researchers out there. You have your traditional bug hunters that are motivated by the cash payout. They're gonna be happy to lob a report over the over the uh, the fence, and as long as they get paid, they don't care. They're not gonna bother you about like disclosure windows or anything else. Then you have recognition seekers, and I don't mean that negatively, but I mean people who are like typically we see this in academics, right? Academics often can't accept a bounty anyway, so they don't care. They care about, can I talk about this at a conference? Am I going to get my name next to a CVE for this? They are looking for that, how do I make sure that I'm, um, that I'm able to build my resume, build my, my street cred based on my research, right? So your academics are going to be, or your recognition seekers are going to be different than your bug hunters. They're going to be motivated by different things. You have like friendly helpers as we call them. So that's like government agencies or sometimes other companies. Like, so sometimes my technology is similar to my competitor's technology. And um, if I get a report that I know that impacts my competitor, I tell them. Um, I, we, we have a number, we, we call the, the bat line and we say, hey, other company, um, this impacts me and it probably impacts you too. Um, and they do the same. So those are kind of like friendly helpers, right? Well, so each one of those different kinds of motivations often requires a different kind of incentive. So there's different things that you can do as a program to incentivize the skill set that you want and the results that you want. Payouts is one of them. Um, the other things that you can do are things like, um, we, we call it a, CPEs for CVEs, right? So continuing education credits, right? Like a lot of people have certifications. And if you find a CVE, it's very easy for me as a bug bounty manager to literally write out a certificate for that bug hunter 
and they can take that back to whoever owns their, you know, uh, whether it's uh, EC Council or uh, ISACA or whoever owns that certification, and they can get continuing education credits for the work that they do. That's going to motivate some people more than the payout will. Um, working with researchers to make sure that their timelines are met so they can talk at a conference, or working with them to help improve their overall talk at a conference, or working with them to help them improve their, um, their paper that's going to get published. Those things are specific incentives that you can do to make sure that you're getting the quality results. Um, so I think that the best bug bounty programs are responsive. They're responsive to the needs of the product, and they're responsive to the needs of the, of the researchers or the constituents that they want to get those results from. It's all about figuring out what that balance is. Um, just to use like some concrete examples, maybe like, as a program manager, like, do you know who your top bug bounty hunters are? Um, like, what motivates them? Why are they there? Um, and then similarly, as a program manager, like, do you know what matters to the business? Like, going beyond CV or a CVSS score, sorry. Um, like, what what is a crit? You know, <laughs> to your business, um, and it's not always RCE necessarily. Yeah, and bonuses are delightful too. Just because like sometimes you get locked in this like legal world where there's a definition of the word bounty and you can have a bounty schedule but your legal won't let you change from what that bounty definition is because it's tied to a specific thing and it's tied to like what is the definition of vulnerability. So you can be creative sometimes with payouts on things like if you change, kind of change the definition and say this may not be a traditional vulnerability, which equals a CVE, which equals this payout based on criticality, which is our process, you can sometimes say, like, based on budget, um, will my company take action based on this report? Right? That's a guiding principle. And you can say, if my company will take action based on this report, then this report has value to me. And then I have a set bonus scale. Like, to what level will my company take action on this report? Will my company put out a document change and suddenly uh, change the way that the security guidance is, up, is applied? Well, that might be worth a certain amount of money, and that's a, a bonus payment I can pay to that researcher because I appreciate their, um, I appreciate the, the work that put, they put into finding that, finding that issue, security issue, and sending it to me. And so now I can fix something that I didn't know was a problem, even if it's not a traditional patch. So I think you should be creative in the ways that you think about what is a security harm versus a vulnerability and how do we reward positive behavior. Swag motivates. Um, it helps. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So hopping, hopping on, uh, sort of touching back on something Cusco had mentioned earlier and, and something we've had a few talks on at DEF CON and AppSec Village and whatnot in the past. Uh, and yes, we did skip a question. <laughs> uh, what What are your thoughts on on bounty farming? And if you had to put a specific definition or your spin on bounty farming, what what would you qualify it as? And Cusco's, this one's you to start. All right. So, uh, does anyone here not know what bounty farming is? Just to get the terminology. So, okay. So let's say that you have a platform that is vulnerable to a particular thing, and that platform is like a business to business sort of thing. So they themselves have customers who are using that platform. Those customers roll it out for their clients to use. Um, and so if the vulnerability exists in the platform, should I be reporting that vulnerability to the main parent company or to all the child companies who are running it who may have their own security teams? And so when that happens, you end up in this situation of, again, one to many. Um, and so who is responsible for paying that bounty? My personal thought is that the most at least when we're talking about like the fundamentals of what happened, you've identified a risk, you've reported the risk, and does the entity that you're reporting to agree that it is a risk? And sometimes there's semantics involved. You know, we try to do what we can with prioritization and threat levels and just something to convey across the aisle of if something is bad, how bad is it? And obviously the game in this is we want to explain the situation in such a way to where the damages are material and we can remediate it. If that company pushes a line of code or changes configuration in response to what you've provided, I think that most people will agree that that person has earned a reward, whatever the reward may be. So, you know, if they have a budget, spend the budget towards it. If they don't have a budget, at the very least, some swag of some sort. Or, you know, I've done vulnerabilities, or re I've reported vulnerabilities to place just so that I could be on like a thank you page on their website. Building the CV is material too for you. Um, 
someone should pay and it's unfortunate when there becomes conflict there between who it is um, especially when you have platforms who often shift something out in a secure by default way or at least they've done their best attempt at secure by default the customer of that particular platform gets it and they change settings so that their users can log into it easier a great example is a uh, lack of 2fa so and i don't want to name any particular platforms you know just think there's there's a lot of them uh let's say that it ships with 2fa enabled and a uh, strong password complexity that gets to the client who's buying that particular platform and let's say that that client has a non-technical user base those user base don't want to use 2fa um, or they don't want to use password managers for high entropy passwords. And so now you end up with a situation where you can have eight lowercase characters as an extreme for a password, and some, bu some bug bounty hunter is saying, hey, there's low password entropy here on this particular authentication mechanism. That particular instance is vuln, the main parent company for it shipped it out by secure by default. Um, they could have many child companies that are all doing this, and so there is a vulnerability there, but is it really? We get to the semantics argument. And when you find that situation, and I've found that situation, when I'm typing up the report, I almost have to ask myself, how much do I want to spend in my time and effort arguing that it is something that should be changed? Especially if that particular business uh, is doing it such that they can have customers that use their platform a little bit more. So there's a lot of nuance there. I think that it goes back fundamentally to being accepting of people who are gonna bring risk to you and then figuring out what you can do about it. If there has to be some sort of like, discussion between that particular client and the parent company on who's going to pay out for it, unfortunately it needs to be had and not everyone has those dialogues for it. I mean, you know, at best sometimes you have like customer service rep from node one talking to customer service rep from two, from node two, maybe one of them only has access to the security company and there's just so much red tape in the way that you're not going to get a practical solution in any meaningful amount of time. So what ends up happening is that that bounty researcher is frustrated. They feel like they've spent a whole lot of effort on something, or maybe they haven't, but they still typed up the report and brought something to your attention. Um, I don't think we have anyone who really says that, or I haven't seen, like a thing was shipped to us in this secure by default way and then we've changed it. And we're not going to because it's part of how our business operates. I've seen that. Have you? Yeah, um, because, and so I sit on the CVE board just for, for um, full disclosure there. So I've been a, a CVE board member for you know, 10 years. Um, and when we get into like traditional definition of what is a vulnerability, what you're describing is a misconfiguration and not a vulnerability. And so some companies will say that's a misconfiguration and not a vulnerability because it was, uh, the device is, at, is, um, is operating as intended. It's a shit secure practice, <laughs> like security practice. Like it's not a good practice, but it was set up that way to be that way because the customer wanted it that way. And that's the implementation of the device, not the device. So yeah, I've seen that. Okay, so let's say it's not a, let, let's get to something more practical. I'm like, okay, it's not, a, it's not a misconfiguration. Uh, the product has been shipped out, people are using it. And let's just say it's like cross-site scripting on the login page, so you know improper username, the username comes back reflected with whatever input the user gave it, and so now every instance, every installation of this is vulnerable to this particular thing. What's that? Still a misconfiguration. Still a misconfiguration. Okay, well, let's say that... Log4j? Apache Zero Day. <laughs> all of those. Um, but something more tangible that affects all the different installations. And so each one is, should be racing to fix it, but they're likely gonna have different security maturity mechanisms. Um, the fastest way for something like that to get fixed, especially in a zero day situation, is that the parent company fixes it at the platform level, and then that is automatically cascading down to everyone who has their own installations of it. Unless those are too custom, such that it can't accept the update, and I've seen that happen before too. Um, in that situation, my personal opinion is that the parent company should pay for it. But then again, at that same time, is this a one-to-many payout or is it a one-to-one? -one? Because like, let's say that you reporting this vulnerability to the parent company has fixed a thousand different installations and you wanted to have the argument that this was like a thousand SQL injections or a thousand RCEs. Um, so like, uh, at least my view on this anyways is like, if you're, if you're, if you find it, using Apache as an example, if you find a zero-day in Apache, I want to hear about it because it impacts my products. If you're reporting a, a, like a one day as in like something that's been, a CVE has been issued for it and a patch has been published and we have to go and pick up the patch, it's probably already in our pipeline. Um, I, I like policies where, or I like programs where there's like a 30-day window essentially where the program has a chance to fix things and then they can go and you can go and uh, report something after a certain amount of time. 
Um, but for like original research, like I think part of bug bounty is to incentivize that. Uh, that's my view anyways. Yeah, I'd say it comes down to how well was your program terms written, right? So every every company who's running a bug bounty program should take the time to look at their product and look at their bug bounty terms. Uh, and if you have something, I mean, you can eliminate those one to one, one to many by simply saying that like the vulnerability is tied to the vulnerable code, not how many instances of the vulnerable code exist. So you you, you root cause it basically. But you need to make that real clear in your terms well before someone comes to you with a with that problem. So, and that is something that can be thought about real early on. It shouldn't be a surprise. You shouldn't get a researcher submitting a hundred tickets for the same kind of problem um, that roots two. down to one. Submit all your tickets. Don't hold. Don't do two at a time. <laughs> <laughs> all you're doing is screwing yourself because. Because it goes by the day. I'm telling you, all you're doing is screwing yourself. If you put, if you give me 30 tickets and they're all different, substantially different, I'm a page through one of those tickets. If you hold them and then I fix that problem and I've just negated your entire uh, research that you had on 28 other tickets, give them to me now. Give me all the tickets. Um, but it, it yeah, I, <laughs> I think the program terms are really important, right? So like thinking through your use cases and thinking through like this could happen and I need to be very clear with my researchers before they ever start working on my product that these are the terms that are gonna get paid out and I can't be changing the game halfway through after they've submitted a report. Like that's not cool, that's not kosher, you don't, you don't do that. They submitted the report, you pay the report under the terms that currently exist. You change your terms later, well then you have a cutoff date and you say anything comes past this time is gonna be subject to these terms. But if you submitted it before, then you fall. Like it's just being fair and being honest and being decent. Like so you build that trust. You don't have that trust, then why why would a researcher submit the vulnerability to you and not sell it? So do the right thing, build trust. So again, because uh, the title of this whole panel is the realities of bug bounty life, I want to go back to what are what are my what are the realities? What are my incentives to actually report this to the main parent program? Which let's say okay, they are either going to pay nothing. Or they'll pay. They'll treat it as one valid, unique thing, and you know they luck out by fixing it. It fixes all the other, you know, multiple installations that are that are wrong, uh, or incorrect rather, not wrong. Security is hard to do. We want to be very blameless about remediation. Um, I can either not get paid, or get paid, or maybe get paid a multiple. Or if I submit it to the parent company, if they have a child company who's using that platform and they have a particular, you know, they have a security team, I could submit it to them and the exact same thing may happen. Read the terms. Read the terms. And, and I should read and, the terms. And get as many vulnerabilities by but, any candidates as you can. And, and read so, all the terms. I promise, I'm getting, I'm getting okay. to this. Uh, we as bug bounty program managers, look, we know who's bounty farming. We talk to each other, we're all doing the same thing and if you submit a vulnerability to 10 different security programs that is all basically the same thing, uh, I'm just going to throw WordPress out there because there's a million WordPress installations and nearly every company is using it to some degree. If you find a WordPress vulnerability, instead of submitting it to WordPress, and instead you submit it to a company who's using it, um, they may pay out, this one may pay out, this one may pay out, and then the next thing you know, we're like, hey, I'm getting all these reports for WordPress. Oh, I got that too. Um, oh, this person is bounty farming. Um, we understand why it happens, but also I don't think you're going to win any good favors with the people who are inviting you to programs, who are trying to create good targets for you, um, and so like intent really is everything there and it should be both ways. Both from the researcher side, it's probably an unethical thing to do, but again, it is the reality, it probably happens. Also, they might be younger in their career and not know there's a parent company doing it. Um, maybe they've found some, you know, there's a, let's use like single sign-on for instance, and they found an issue with a particular single sign-on instance for one particular product, not knowing that like it's Okta behind the scenes or something. It's not always very apparent. Some, it often is, but it doesn't have to be. Um, how do they know that that should go to like the main SSO provider? And so I think it comes down to giving them an opportunity to kind of just like state their case. And if they found a multiple thing that applies to many things, that's fine. Um, like I know someone who knows like some really cool exploits with Chromeless head or, uh, headless Chrome browsers. And so anywhere where he sees that feature operating in an application, yeah, that should be fair game for him to go seek it out. Um, because the configuration of that particular product might be different than the product itself. Again, it just comes down to intent and good faith researcher. State your case. Know what you, you know you're doing something bad if you're doing it, and the people on the receiving end will become, become wise to it eventually. That is the reality of it. I'm going to differentiate. And I know we got to wrap up, but I'm just going to say real quick, um, hate the game, not the player. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I, run a, I run a bug bounty program at a company, right? Like, we all talk to each other. 
there's a whole big community of bug bounty managers. We have honest conversations. All of us are part of it. Um, but if you find it, submit it. Like, if you get paid out twice, you get paid out twice. You get paid out ten times, you get paid out ten times. I'm not gonna like hate somebody because they submitted it to me and then they submitted it to a competitor and they submitted it to somebody else. Like, okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick in my lane. I'm gonna pay the stuff that I agreed to have paid to. Um, so hate hate the game, don't hate the player. But at the same time, if the company says, "Sorry, this isn't my product," because this is actually this parent company's product, don't fight that. Like, just let it, let it go, um, because it's it's not going to be worth anybody's time fighting it and you're just going to lose any goodwill you had. I do also think that if that happens, you know, in the interest of trying to create a strong community around this and like, you know, bringing legitimacy to it, that company probably has stepped into some era of responsibility for walking that up the chain, seeing if it will be valid for that other particular program. And like bug bounties are not taboo anymore. We're 10 years into this maturing as like its own particular vertical of security. Um, even to such to the point where if you notice that a company doesn't have a responsible disclosure program, I'm pretty sure they're considered less than. Now, there are very tactful ways for us to have that conversation as part of, like a, as part of a maturity effort and you know, growing what you're uh, trying to protect your customers from becoming exploited towards. But I do think that, that whichever company gets the thing that says, hey, this isn't my problem, it's someone else's, would probably be behooved to walk that up the chain and see if they can, you know, redirect that, direct that behavior, researcher yeah. to a good program. The same way that we ask for researchers to be good faith researchers, I think that we should be good faith program managers. Yeah, don't just close the report and be like, not my problem. Um, cl close the report and tell the researcher, hey, not my problem, I can't fix this, but you have, should go talk to this person at this company because they have a bug bounty program and your report is valid for them. It takes a, just a little bit more time to do that and it's gonna probably save the relationship between the researcher and the and the company by doing that. All right, and that is perfect. So we're going to end right on time. Uh, obviously, we don't have time for Q and A. If you do want to chat with any of us, find us out in the hall right afterwards. Thank you, and here's how you can get in touch with everybody.